Welcome to Tukey's Digest. I'm David, and we're entering the world of OSR, BroSR, and the newly published Brozer, Island of War and Winter. I'm here to navigate the, the wilderness of D and, or AD&D with uh, two wonderful guests, very knowledgeable with the subject. Jeffro Johnson, uh, author of Appendix N and How to Win at D&D. Welcome, Jeffro. Hello. And then also Gabe, who is a scholar, poet, and writer. Go, go ahead, Gabe. Just, in, in, just introduce yourself if, you, if I missed anything. Uh, yeah, no, that's mainly it. I've been uh, writing about uh, fantasy and science fiction and its relationship to literature for a couple of years now, and which is where I intersected with Jeffro and all of these things you've mentioned, OSR and so on. Yeah. No, and I hugely appreciate you both being on here. This is for anyone's a uh, long, longer listener of the Tukey's Mag crew, uh, a small side project uh, I'm doing called the Digest, where we uh, talk to people uh, or just analyze uh, newer projects, uh, newer cultural uh, efforts that are kind of ongoing. And today the the focus is Brozer and uh kind of doing a rabbit hole you know in our past episodes this, this is probably a spiritual way i uh fo- sequel and follow up to some of my pet projects like the parapolitics stuff the um the um the the bald author bullying episode we did way back at christmas time uh where, where I, david gets sucked into a rabbit hole and then just keeps researching and reading about stuff he half understands uh, but now I have people that are actual experts that can correct me on things. And Brozer, if you gentlemen will bear with me, I can give you a quick or book report of how I came to, you know, reach out to you. Reach out to you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. So it all, it all started on X.com, unfortunately, embarrassingly enough. Uh, Kirsova, a friend of the show, unofficial friend of the show, uh, had shared uh, this bizarre looking PDF file. And he, he said, I don't know how I got into this, but here it is. It's done. And it said, uh, Brozer on the front. It has a picture of a Roman legionnaire and um, a frogman stabbing each other with a, with a buff, half-naked wizard flexing over the two of them. And I was immediately captivated. Do either of you recall off the top of your head, or, or were one of you the, the ones that made that cover? Oh, the Sky Hernstrom made that. He's he's one of the top fantasy authors alive today, and uh, yeah, he played with us when we were developing a lot of these ideas. Incredibly evocative, like just in, in terms of bang for buck for it, no color, just just a sketch. Like it just incredibly evocative. I'm gonna have it in the thumbnail of this episode. Uh, I click it. I start. I started reading a little bit. I didn't read. I I have read all of it at this point. At the time, um, I didn't read all the um, the factions, but I did read the the rest of it. At the time, I just sort of read the first page or two. I got a gist. I read your really excellent essay as well, Gabe, about the reasoning it's, uh, which I'd like to get into later about why this is a free product you guys have put out. Um, but it's, the the gist of it I got from that was this is a old school callback to role-playing following on uh, the idea of something called a, of, of a Bronstein or Bronstein, which I had never heard of before. And the idea is a uh, multiplayer sort of strat- more strategy focused PVP with fog of war game, like tabletop game is the gist I got from at the time. And, and then I go into YouTube, I look up, what is this? And I, it's kind of hard for me, at least from SEO, a basic search. I could not find anything that was super informative. I found a ton of the right kind of people seething, furious about it, um, until eventually I found there was an interview, Jeffro, you did with Black Lodge Games. Shout out to those guys, by the way. They actually put out a very interesting show. Like I actually really enjoyed listening to some of their conversations on there. I don't totally understand everything they're saying, but they seem to me putting out a lot of high effort stuff. And then my, my interest reached a crescendo with the infamous old man, middle finger drama, which I'll put on the screen for YouTube. Anyone that's watching that. Can you guys explain like what that is? Like what are we looking at here with the, with the two old men giving the middle finger? The fight with Griff is odd. Uh, he came on 
a podcast with Dunder Moose, which is a really, really fun show, and talked about playing Bronstein, the development of Bronstein, all by this guy, David Wesley, who was friends with Dave Arneson, who really developed D&D, uh, friends with all this um, big group of Midwestern war gamers in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And he has all of these documents uh, from Wesley. And there is, I think, this kind of sense from people that ha uh, that are curating this legacy that they would like to be the last word on what it means and what people can do with it. And the friction, I think, arises from a lot of people like Jeffro, like myself, uh, like the authors of, of Broser, who don't want to wait for a curated museum piece and instead want to take what is a really enlivening piece of gameplay and start using it as soon as possible. Yeah, that, that's been my frustration researching this is it seems like there's an immense amount of heat uh, around the definition games about Bronstein, whether this is or is not a Bronstein that you guys are doing, whether this is like a, a replica, modern replication, or is this a totally new branch of evolution you guys are doing i would you guys disagree that you're doing what you're doing is is new in some ways from what was being done then uh, yes it is absolutely new yes um yeah. the the uh um the, the two differences in david wesley and myself are this Dave, david wesley He's, he's credited with running the first role-playing game, and I don't think that's quite fair. Uh, now, he did uh, switch from, you know, people running uh, armies in the game to people playing individual roles. So, you know, technically you could say that that he, um, it, he that it is a role-playing game, but nobody uses the word role-playing game in any kind of strict definitional way mm -hmm. like that. Um uh, but nevertheless, what he did, did eventually develop into uh, the game Dungeons and Dragons, which is extremely important. Um, and uh, so now just as an example of that, Dave Arneson's game was Blackmore. It was very, very intriguing game that developed under, under him as he ran it. And uh, there was one at one point where he said, I'm running a... A fantasy Bronstein on this date, you know, there's going to be refreshments. Please come, and and that was Blackmore, uh, an early state, an incarnation of it. Um, so so what what David Wesley did is is important, partly because of who he influenced and then what they did with it. And so the game Bronstein itself, yeah, it's sort of a sort of a random curiosity in the attic of a bunch of D&D &D fans, right? And we, you know, we <laughs> you get it down every once in a while, look at it, or people write a blog post about it, but it didn't, it never really changed anything. And you and you can see people in forums where they're like, hey, I, I, I even played it with David Wesley. I would really like to do one myself, but I haven't got any idea how. Um, so it turns out to be, I mean, it's obvious when I look at it that, oh, you should just do this. And, and you know, talking to people, you know, what I see that seems obvious to me isn't obvious to most yeah. people. Um, so the fact that we have Broser where we finally written down how to do this is is extraordinary because not even David Wesley has done that yet. OK, after 50 yeah. years, it's um, sort of this um, legend of the old tables. Right. That's what it seems like right. people people talk about having been there, having seen it. But there is no manual that people are able to right. apply. So, so the difference, uh, another difference between me and David Wesley is, um, uh, I come at this as as someone who's been confounded by role playing games his whole life. I I don't feel like uh, before twenty twenty that I ever got a really good experience out of them. I mean, I tried. And it and it's it, they're they're a hard genre to master. They're very they seem very fragile. Um, if I'd had an intuition about it, I would have suspected that there was something missing 
that would fix that. But that never crossed my mind. I always, for years, thought, "Oh, I'm just not good at this," or, you know, or, or you know, I'm, I'm sure someone somewhere is having a good experience with these games. That, but it, I can't imagine it, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I, I ended up doing over the past four years, uh, in in a series of of, of games, I ran, uh, you know, as if you know, sort of like developing a game, developing, play testing these ideas, seeing where they work. What I was doing, I was using Bronstein to to fix the intrinsic problems of role playing games, to get a better experience out of role playing game sessions. In in terms of like uh, an affirmation of what you guys are doing, the the reviews speak for themselves. Like the what the thing that made me want to reach out to you guys was you guys had consistently just a lot of energy and excitement in Jeffro to a lot of the stuff you were putting out. Um, was it Broser dubs, a few other guys that were seemed to be behind this because Broser is a collaborative project. There's every section has a different author of the document. Um, and it just has that, it, it's that boys being boys, just guys having fun energy. It just permeates it. And um, the people, <laughs> your haters inspired me because there was just people would, people would just not stop shitting on you in particular, Jeff Rowe, <laughs> several other people, or just not naming and, and, and taking these very um, cringe uh, centrist positions of like, Oh, both sides just don't get it. But before we get too far, cause again, this is more, a more general audience. I want to just put out a, a reason I think this is important is because one, as Jeff Rowe just uh, explained very clearly, this, this really is and agreed with sort of my suspicion this is something new. Like this is something new in the tabletop world that does not happen every day. That's this, that's kind of a special event. And I also, I, I pride myself uh, maybe more than is justified on feeling. I can sense a trend when it's like get, getting a swell under it. I feel like this browser first edition, there's a lot more that you guys can do and can build on. So I, I just, I, I see the potential for it because I'm excited. I'm still a little unsure how to play myself. And I think maybe we'll get to that. But I, I guess if you guys could just help give me a little bit more background on, before we get into uh, Browser itself, can you explain to a more general audience, like what is OSR and BroSR? Because my understanding is I, I heard of OSR um, I don't know how many years ago I saw a thread on TG on 4chan, <laughs> an OSR old school Renaissance. My understanding is people to go back and play advanced dungeons and dragons, like the older first earlier edit first editions of dungeons and dragons. Is that, is that a fair description? And they, what's, what's sort of the animating principles behind it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, in around 2000 or so wizards of the coast bought D and D from, from TSR, mm-hmm. um, and and when they did that, they completely changed the game around sort of a, a Magic the Gathering style of, of play. Uh, and, and so instead of like really simple characters, uh, you know, with with relatively simple adventures, you had uh, feet chains and other things I don't mm-hmm. understand, and it was very uh, systematized to to be played on a grid and. And you would walk into game stores and there would be miniatures, plastic miniatures to buy specifically for this game. I mean, they were going to monetize every single inch of this concept. That Is they lack could. of character and, death also a big thing that you guys see? Like, it seems like OSR people like that their characters can die, whereas... The yes. modern yeah, version no, is like modern. my OC can't die, has to, he has to survive from the, or the end of the campaign. That's definitely a thing. And you'll you'll people will roll up a character and die that same night and roll up another one the same night, uh, you know, and 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 yeah. So the OSR kind of came in like you now had like different views on D and D because you had such radically different approaches to it with the same name now, and um and now now the old games did not have a good reputation because they're they're kind of weird. Uh, they're you know there's a lot of things that a Contemporary designer will just immediately change if they see those old rule sets, um, and um, uh, so around 2003 or 2004, I think, 
you when the when blogging was really cool you saw a lot of people like hundreds of blogs of people that were writing about their D&D games the old games and explaining to people who didn't understand it why these old games worked and you know I lived through the era the era when when the old games were popular and the, and the and dominant and the norm and I thought they were dumb then I didn't understand it but when I, when I read these blogs and they're like Oh, you want to do what it says here because it actually works. You know, I paid attention to that. I tried it and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, the game, the game works when you do what it says. This is amazing. Um, and it was definitely more fun than I saw with the Wizards D&D stuff. So, so no, there was, there was um, from 2003 all the way up to the present, there's been nonstop blogging discussion and analysis of the, of the old games championing, championing it over the more recent editions. The, probably the biggest uh, high water mark of, of that kind of excitement around the old editions was probably when fourth edition came out and and people were so mad at wizards uh, over what they thought fourth edition being bad was all about that that uh, there was a lot of people moved over into the old school space and and, and, and engaged with that a little bit more so yeah and fifth edition supposedly was meant to accommodate that cultural shift that happened about then. And that's, of course, an, uh, an entire different mm-hmm. debate. But yeah, that's the OSR in a nutshell. Uh, let me give an, uh, an alternative history to that that isn't a contradiction. Uh, I would describe the OSR as a bunch of artists, uh, particularly uh, Dyson Logos and Zach Sabbath or Zach Smith, discovering that d d rule manuals uh, could be works of art uh, and maps, these old style of maps that you used to have inside the very poorly printed d d modules that you would get uh, could be developed into really interesting looking uh, designs and pictures and all this kind of thing so there was a a real thread running through the osr um that looked at all these sort of things peripheral to the game in order to make works of art around them and that is partly why they gravitated towards these older weirder more arcane expressions of the game and also because you know wizards was very much keeping a a, you know a close eye on any of the actual modern publications that were coming out although they had developed a license for people to uh, publish what they called the the ogl or the open gaming license but there's a, a strong thread running through the osr of bookmaking as an art form and dungeon design as an art form and that is in part why there's this emphasis in osr games if you go uh, look at them on simplicity of the characters and that sort of thing um because the the emphasis was on making beautiful books and interesting charts and cool maps and all of these peripheral elements to it all. Which is not to uh, contradict what Jeffro was saying about the OSR, but that is a, another thread that I think really defines it. And you can still see this. There's a whole um, bunch of people that continue to put out uh, little splat books and pamphlets, uh, like Broser in, in a certain way, that are really not meant to be played but are just art objects. Yeah. And the difference, I would say, with something like Broser is that the the cool aesthetics of the, you know, the amazing artwork on the cover and the, the layout of it are secondary to it being used in a game. But there's a, a, a lot of emphasis in the OSR on beautiful peripheral elements. Yeah, there's almost like a, like a punk vibe. A lot of the Absolutely. aesthetics I've seen is there's a lot of black and white art you know very like um simple not simple i don't know it's not overly elaborate paintings maybe some of the ones you're referring to do have that um 
but a lot of my, in my limb experience, that's what I've seen. And there's an emphasis on, I was talking about this actually with um, another friend of the show, Cairo Smith, about why modern D and D art is so lame compared to some of the old stuff. Like he, he was asking like, like what, like what changed? And he was pointing out there was like a person in a wheelchair and there was like some other more like more gimmicky stuff in it. And um, the th- conclusion we were coming to was it's more just like, it's like this emphasis on like more mythic art, like it's more like mythic. It's, it's just, it's a very different style. Um, and that's just like the visual elements. Now what, what's the, the root of amateur is, uh, is, is love, right? You, you do it cause you love mm-hmm. it. Like you look at, you look at the seventies artwork and it's, it's, you know, it's kids. It's like 12 year old Errol Otis or whatever drawing these pictures for these little fanzines and for, for dragon magazine, you know, making his way up to where he would do the basic set covers and things like that. You know, that, that original cadre of, of artists, uh, you know, computers hadn't ruined art yet. You know, there was no, uh, there was no Photoshop yet. There was no desktop publishing, you know, you had, you had to learn how to, how to paint, how to draw and, uh, it's just better. It's subjectively better in every way. It's real uh, in multiple levels. Uh, it's and it's beautiful. Um, and it, it and it's somebody who's participating in an actual culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's we don't have that at all today, at all, and on any level, it, it's just completely gone. Uh, which is you know. I couldn't agree more. And it's something I talk about a lot, this idea of a living culture and a culture is only alive if people are like participating in it, engaging with it actively, which is why in our small way, our main podcast on the podcasting side, on the writing side, I write fiction and I also write essays, but on the podcasting side, our main focus is on highlighting fiction and engaging with new works that people put out, right? Like living culture and actually creating a living back and forth and feedback on new projects. And so that was one of the main reasons, like I was very inspired seeing what you guys were doing and also Gabe, your essay, I want to shout out. And if you had, I think it might tie into this topic of living culture. And then you had a lot of uh, conversation in yours about uh, like collective goods and like, role-playing games as like a, was it a collective good am I using the right term I don't know if you have any I, I guess you want to give a, a brief highlight of it um, uh, I, I think the term I used it. in the in the essay was common good common yes and that's just taken from very sort of classical political philosophy mm-hmm. uh, Aristotle Thomas Aquinas the idea of the common good being those goods that everyone can share in equally without uh, diminishing it, and in fact, by sharing in it, expanding it, uh, multiplying it. And I, I, that resonated with me very strongly also because my experience with D&D, fairly limited. I played a bit of 4.0. That's like when I came up, that was out. And I didn't, I wasn't aware of any kind of OSR revolution or whatever. Um, and I was always kind of grossed out by, like I always played with, when we did combat stuff, it was just graph paper with like, I made little, cut out paper squares as your little horn helmet on it or something like you know people have these like expensive tokens and all this other shit um which no offense if you want to make nice stuff like that it's totally cool but some about the expectation and some of the consumerist culture of it i found kind of um tiring maybe it sounds like it conflicts with the art side i don't think it does um, no, no. For the for the first uh, two or three years of D and D's existence, the assumption around everyone that played it was that there would be no grid, there would be no combat grid, there would be not even any miniatures. You know, th- th- which is this is odd because it came out of a miniature gaming scene. But if if you play a lot of D and D, you you realize just how useful it is to be able to to play against any monsters that happen to come up. At, but because of the scenario, you know, you don't, you don't have, you don't, you're not going to have every single monster in the monster manual with a figure on hand to do this. Uh, but the other thing, uh, you know, uh, TSR had a tagline for a long time called products of your imagination. And I, I think what you will find if you dispense with maps, combat maps, miniatures, 
Uh, and if you're playing online, if you dispense with even little sketches of like, okay, there's this thing over here, and then you draw a little squiggle on the uh, shared mm -hmm. thing. And there's this other thing over here. Um, you know, after the dust is settled and the game is done and you talk about it, the only thing you will remember after those games is either what you saw on the battle board or what you saw on the squiggle drawings. Uh, but if you if you dispense with those, if you if you eliminate those, there is this thing in your mind that uh, like it's all, like images in your mind of what happened, uh, and, and, there's, and there's a kind of a weird aspect to it. It's almost like something you actually experience. It goes. It resides in your brain and the part of your brain where memories are stored even. And when you're talking about these things with your friends like a week later or, or a month later, uh, those memories that you of the things that you imagined in those scenes, like they're still there. Uh, and somehow they're all in everyone else's brains as well. It's, um, it's a unique property of these games that is lost when they are translated into this more commercialized mm -hmm. form. Yeah, and I completely agree. I guess I want to dive in, and um, again, this I, I want to provide this as a brief summary for people that maybe aren't familiar with this and um, are interested in it. Could you guys give, I guess, like a really quick summary of just how Browser came to be? And then I have some questions. How the hell is it played? In fact, maybe let's skip the development for now. Um, I'll just say I know it's a collective project. I know you guys were key contributors. I know there was uh, Kirsova, um, a dozen other people, and they're all listed on the document, which I will link at the bottom. How the hell is Browser play? Because I have re I've read the document. I generally get it. I get, but do you? You are you integrating AD and D rules in addition to what you're providing here? Am I understanding that right? Uh, you can. Browser was designed to be played, uh, really, with any kind of basic fantasy role-playing system yeah. Uh, with the rules for how to translate that into mass combat that Jeffro wrote That'd being be applicable to more or less any system. But Browser is played like a Bronstein is played, which is to say uh, the way I've done it uh, is to, I have a, a gaming group. I invite them over. I, I We distribute factions or characters sometimes people are playing a single individual sometimes people are a playing a faction within with a head of an army and actual units to mess around with default correct is that you are you're playing a character but the character is essentially the leader of a faction right so there's like the right. frogman faction there's the roman faction and each one you know, let's say the three of us are playing, or, or let's say Jeffro would be the, the referee, and then I would be the frogman, Gabe, you would be the Roman, and we both be the leader. And the idea is there's always instantaneous communications. You actually like have conversations around the table about yeah, what Yeah, so when I run it in my house, well, uh, what I will do is I will set up in the corner with paper, um, basic map, uh, index cards, rule books, dice to resolve things. And then I basically open up my house to all the players. They get some drinks, snacks, walk around. Some are in the living room, some are in the kitchen, some are in the dining room with me. They each have their goals that their faction is trying to achieve. And they are discussing with the other players, uh, making treaties, making alliances, making promises. And then when they are ready to act in the game world, they will come to me as the referee with either some verbal orders, uh, you know, oh, I'm transferring this, you know, barony that I promised to this other character to his name. But I'm also leaving, you know, XYZ of my personal uh, assassins there to act if I ever want them to. So a very freeform game turn, and then I'll integrate that into the game state, uh, you know, like a, a, a GM in a typical role-playing game, and then they'll go off and someone else will come and someone will say, hey, I'm going to send one of my uh, flying bat uh, assassins to go, you know, assassinate the head of this faction, and then I will call that person over 
and we will resolve that interaction. And if it's something that would be common knowledge to everybody else, I'll let everybody else know. Uh, so that it's orders coming in in a freeform fashion. That's one of the ways you can do it. You can also do it where it's much more like the famous board game Diplomacy. Everyone has 15 minutes or so of discussion, and then everyone writes orders that they turn in that are then all resolved. And then once those are all resolved, everybody goes back and has 15 to 20 minutes more of milling about and making alliances and making plans, turning in another set of orders. And that's how the, the evening would go. That, that one made more intuitive sense to me. Like I, I'm able to picture that one a little more clearly because you're around the table. The, I'm, thank you for walking me through the the former though, because I can, I can kind of grasp that because there was the three tentative like formats that I think Jeffro was in your essay. And the third you said was with the more challenging. I think um, another one was like virtual. Like you could do it over like a group chat like as like a long form which would be if i'm understanding right that which that which seems like it would be pretty intense uh like you have to wake up and you're like oh i took a hit i took a you know we got invaded or something at all times you're on alert no when, when we play these things remotely uh uh you know, something happens uh when, when there's uh betrayals mm. or or when some pivotal action is and i'm contacting everybody individually and everyone could potentially put, betray everyone else at any moment. Then you know the the cell phones are uh, engaged all day, uh, mm -hmm. and you know people are, yeah. It, it's it's a very addictive type of gameplay because of the paranoia factor. Yeah. That sounds like so much fun. It'd be cool to have like a broser day with the bros, and it's just like all right, Saturday we're gonna have it, and like it has to resolve within a certain amount of time. I don't know. I, all that to say, like, I, I it activates my imagination because I just see. You sound like you want to play with the guys because you, you just want to see how it's done. Yeah, a little bit. I'm tempted. Um, Do yeah. it. Yeah, plug me in. Get, add me to whatever chats or whatever this there's, is. There's there's one going on right now that uses Amber Diceless as the thing. I think they could possibly accept a walk-in. You may have to make up a weird character or faction yourself, but they will drop you on the island potentially, uh, you know, uh, mid-game. I mean, you've missed a little bit of the beginning, yeah. but I, I think Arneson did it that way. Wesley did it that way. So, I mean, we could do it that way, yeah, too. I am interested. Because there me a, as a maybe. Not not right now. Here's my one of my challenges. And one... I don't want to say recommendation, a thought for you guys in future editions, because I hope you do do future editions of this and like keep um, developing it. Cause it, I, I see so much potential there and energy I, for me. I was like, I, one, I don't know AD and D rules. So, you know, maybe skill issue. I'll admittedly, I was a little like unclear and I know there is a thing like there is a lot of open-endedness on purpose about you could apply this, any rules to this, but I do think it might benefit just to have a little more, certainty or like what's the what's the way i want to put this like newbie don't don't have like leaving a newbie with no questions like look default do this do this do this use this system set up with this many players so i guess that would be my one my one recommendation having read the um you, one. you want the complete turnkey package a bit yeah it, you know, it doesn't have to have all the rules in it or even just but maybe just like a you know, no reference. we, we yeah. could make a small role-playing game with small combat system uh i mean like i mean it, there's there's historical antecedents mm -hmm. for this on guard from game designers workshop is basically this uh so so no it's not that out there but you want a complete game. You you don't want a solution to all the problems of RPGs. You want a distinct game that you can just yes take it and and not think and just do what it exactly. says. Exactly. Don't get a make good me think. Well, here's the thing: have it open ended. But I think just having that default starting point to keep people onboarded. Like for me, for example, if I if I wasn't able to talk to you guys. I would have more questions or the, I would still had these questions. I would not have an easy outlet for them. And maybe if I joined, I don't know what kind of, I don't know how to connect. And that's my sort of my next question is how to connect with these I'm new people. I'm so disappointed to hear this though, because uh, the, you know, the initial feedback that we got from the, uh, the, the diehard role players that have been arguing with us for four years was that, Oh, we finally <laughs> understand what they've, they've been doing all this time now. And I'm like, okay, good. We, we did it. We explained it. And now you're saying that I have it. Two outsiders. To the inner, 
the outer the the two inch outer core of the inner core of uh dnd ad and d o osr bro and bro osr people i think it's crystal clear to them but to my layer of you know oh you know i played a few games of dnd or i dm'd one time 10 years ago it's like oh, you know i i get a lot of it but it's like I, it's like I, I, am I comfortable enough that I could like launch it that I that I look, could be the guy that look, takes it to the table? Yes, you yes you can do it, and I'm I'm going to tell you why you need to not wait for us to, to solve this problem for you. Uh, one, it's a lot of fun. Uh, two, Bronstein is an extremely anti fragile idea. Uh, if you exp- if you play with it yourself, you'll be like, oh, first off, it'll be a disaster, but everyone will have fun and everyone will say they want to play it. <laughs> That's again. key. Um, uh, so, so like this idea that you're, you're waiting for me to tell you how to do it and you're afraid to, you're going to mess it up. No. Okay. You have an objectively wrong idea. Um, uh, so, um, like whatever you're playing, any art, any art role-playing game that you're playing, uh, the most common feature of a continuing role-playing, can, can you play a role-playing game? Are you at least on that level? Yes or no? Oh yeah. I, I've DM'd. Yeah, I've G- I, yeah. And I've played. Okay. So if, if you if you have a role playing game campaign and it's gone for ten sessions, um, and you have players that have a little bit of autonomy, they're not just playing in a story that you made, but they're moving around in a world and doing whatever they want. Oh, yeah, it's the only way to play. Um, the, th- what's going to happen is is they're going to you're, you're going to meet uh, other factional leaders uh, as they explore the world. They'll be the leader of the frogmen and the leader of the cavemen and and the leader of the mushroom men and they're all you'll, you'll just placing them on your map you know and, and there'll be a, an orc army that's that's moving around on the map and oh what are we going to do about this and and then like you know with adventures like nothing ever happens in adventures really or it's very focused it's very it's like the plot of a short story but it, it mm-hmm. is not a, the grand epic scope of, of, say, Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings when you're playing with a single group of adventurers doing things. And, and so over time, the longer your campaign goes, the more static material ends up getting introduced into the game world. And if you're like me, there's a part of you that's like, gosh, we never did anything with the Goblin Town that was next to our, our fantasy series city that we ripped off of Fritz Lieber's books. And... And you're like, oh gosh, we never did anything with the, uh, you know, this this other stuff in the far north. You know, like we never did it. And, and man, Elric has been the king of this city for the entire game, and he's never done anything. And so you may look at your fantasy campaign, which is, which is a remarkable uh, invention in and of itself, because it's a reflection of things that you and your friends are all excited about and have invested a lot of time playing with. And you and you're you're playing with these things, and you're like. Wouldn't it be nice if the rest of the world got a turn? If the rest of everything else that is in the game world got to play. Right. Um, and so, and it doesn't, it doesn't take anything. All it takes is you taking the roles of these uh, powers and factions and creatures that you've introduced in the game that are kind of larger than life, maybe larger than the, the players, the individual players who may only be the third or fourth level or something, and not be that big or important in the wider world. But you take these larger entities and hand them over to the people and then just watch what happens. Um, watch what happens. Something will come out of it. Some some of your players will be kind of meh. They're not going to be very active or they'll be uh, shying away from conflict. Um, but others are going to start negotiating. They're going to start plotting. They're going to start scheming. And and the more people that you have involved in this, then the you know they're, 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 there's going to be sides that are drawn up, and then something is going to go down. And then whatever that is, it's going to be like the Archduke Ferdinand getting assassinated, and things are going to happen. And 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 that, no matter what rule system you're using, no matter what your level of skill is. When things go off the rails, when things get weird, when things put you in a place as a referee of like, I've never had to adjudicate anything like this. Uh, that, that is really the raison d'etre of this game form. And, 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 and we haven't stopped tinkering with it for four years. Okay, we have not, there's nothing else we write. Like we talk sometimes of like, 
ah, will we ever go back to another type of game? And it's like, we can't. Uh, we can't. We can't sit down at tables that play regular RPGs anymore because we get so bored we're going to flip the table and get in a fist fight or something. It's it's a mess. It, we're, we're, we're terrible, terrible people. You've gone rabid. Because we've been so spoiled. Um, so, but yes, so don't wait for us. Like, don't wait well, for us. The I, I want to be clear. I'm not doing this for me. I'm also just for you guys in terms of growth. I, I think if you don't do it, someone will in terms of creating a really simple starter package. Because again... Getting people in the door, butts in seats. We we just made it. We just made your starter package, and we gave it away for free. For sure. <laughs> and again, I hope this isn't coming across as a as a harsh criticism because I'm I'm complimenting what you guys are doing. But that is my my one my one suggestion. But I think you raised a good point, Jeffro, about the other aspect is is like integrating integrating into ongoing if people have tabletop campaigns the essential ideas here are just about introducing interplayer conflict interworld conflict and it creates a very um easily replicable framework for how you can create that and then there's a term you guys have used a few times um in the document and interviews of uh what's it play along hug along or something for for People being overly cooperative. The get along Thank gang. You. Yes, the get along gang, which I which I've seen and and would you know anyone that knows anything about fiction, it, but that's not what you want. You do not want every character just just loving and supporting. That's that's a kid show. That's um, you know every problem has to be external or, or kind of kind of framework. Whereas the beauty of this framework is rather than a uh, game master referee. Uh, whatever term you want to use, having to basically write a novel that people have to enact, which is to me like the nightmare version of this of of, of tabletop game. Um, this leans more into that natural. It, it's almost like there's there's like it's like a strategy game. Like there there's something about this that is it's straddling the line between a strategy game and a role playing game where there's like role playing elements. It, or I mean, it's like a grand, it's like a grand strategy role playing game, um, where it's incorporating the the systems of I guess whatever game system you're you're, you're selecting. You guys are using AD and D, as my understanding. That's like your, the primary one, and, but then you're applying it within this 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 Bronstein framework. So, yeah, all that to say, super interesting. Do you guys have anything else? I guess on the design of the game that you feel is like. Uh, essential for people to know about or that would be enticing to them well i think i can offer something that might speak to what you were asking for before with a little bit more clarity about how to just sit down and run one of these things i am a big believer in giving players and factions explicit goals and win conditions uh, some of the others jeffro b dubs are less keen on that idea but one, one way to kickstart things if you want to sit down and just play this is hand each faction a goal. And that goal can be, hey, you want to wipe out the orcs on the other side of the island. Or you want to take over this uh, uninhabited uh, you know, part of the swamp. Mm -hmm. And you also give someone else that exact same goal, right? So that you ensure that some conflict will arise. And as soon as you start doing that, then stuff will get kickstarted. And you, you may not always need to give explicit goals and sort of win conditions, but if you are looking to try and sit down and get this going without with a minimum of uh, people kind of waffling around and not knowing what to do, just give people explicit win conditions. Say, hey, you, you want to become king of this city on the volcano. And just take take the uh, actions you need to go do that. No, and, and I'm 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 of the other. If you want energy in your campaign, then you want to let people play something they're excited about, which is like usually anything they can imagine as a good start. Something that they bring to the table that they're excited about, and then you want them to do something that they're interested in. And, it, and the more you try to tell people what to do, the more friction you're going to have. Like, but if, if they bring the energy because they, they have always wanted to play, say, the Tharks from John Carter of Mars, and they, just, they are just on fire for this, 
you turn them loose in your game with that thing that they're excited about, and that excitement will take care of everything else that, that Gabe is, <laughs> is, is talking about here. Yeah, I, I see as different um, approaches. You could have a view. Like for me, if I was uh, refereeing one of these, I think I would be more something, either a time bomb. Like if, if something doesn't happen by a certain time, a negative consequence will happen. Or um, it, I'm actually doing this from a video game, but like a Thrones of Ascension, if you want to play Dominion's kind of format where if you claim certain points, areas, or if you claim certain items, you get, it just makes you stronger. And so it's not so much that you have to do that, but it's just a, it's just a reward, a, a simple reward structure. Any of a million things like that, that's yeah, would like, incentivize don't, it. Don't overthink it. Stop overthinking it. Like, like you, the, like it's not a video game okay you've got people that are playing around with these these larger than life fantasy ideas and they're playing a role they're not they're not piloting a battle to mech okay they're not playing piloting yeah a giant but people robot. respond they're, to incentive structures i think that i don't think that's uh like a, a turn them loose turn them loose do something that you can't do on a computer do something that you can't do with a board game Right. That's, that's, that's the sweet spot. Aim for that. Right. Drama. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Okay. Anything else? Well, here's this. Here's my last one. What's next for browser and where should people be looking that are interested in this? Uh, or, or who should they be keeping an eye on specifically? Look, look, everybody, look, everybody that is involved in this stuff. It, it's like the Beatles. Uh, when they were putting together uh, their, their last album, Abbey Road, it's like the Beatles when they're working on Abbey Road, they're like they're fighting all the time. They're mad at each other. Like, like this. Um, this is uh, Broser was the uh, the swan song of a particular group of people who had four years of nonstop gaming brilliance. Uh, so I, I don't know what happens after this, but like we 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 argued about this. Uh, on back channels and publicly and and uh, in game sessions and got mad at each other about everything about this uh, but because trying to figure this out uh, different opinions on what it was that was happening and the best way to harness these play dynamics um, uh, I, you know it, it's uh, it's weird you know it's it's weird and funny uh, the the levels of passion surrounding this. Uh, are, you, are you saying Brozer is Brozer and you, the, it doesn't seem like the band's getting back together. Is it maybe? Yeah, it's I, that's what on. I'd say. I'd say this was it. It's over. It's done. Um, I mean, now, to, to you, it's like, it's so big now that you're like, gosh, I want to hear more about it. But to like, to everybody in the scene, it's like, if I hear Bronstein one more time, I'm going to like <laughs> strangle somebody, you know? So, um, uh, like we need to find like a new line of 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 uh, research to pursue i think uh uh i don't know uh, we got or, or some other something else we can do with it that we haven't already done uh i don't know i don't know i we're not we're not really brainstorming too much about it now it's uh it was so hard to to finally sort out what was good about it and what was bad about it and what could be done about the bad part to make the good part better. Um, it, it, it took so much, um, it took so much intellectual effort and collaborative effort and, and actual games where we had no idea what would happen. Uh, it, it took a lot of emotional energy and it, and it, it also burned through a lot of friendships as we did this. Um, so that I, I don't know, uh, uh, I, I think, I think we're done. I, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, maybe, maybe there's some wise guy that's going to pop up and, and be like, Oh, I've, you know, here's this new idea of like, we, we should really do this and, and, and it's going to take off. Maybe, you know, maybe that's happening, but like, I just see just, uh, emotional exhaustion on this topic right now that like people just need, uh, time to themselves, time to heal, mm -hmm. time to pursue other things like, you know, watercolors or, or you know maybe rebuilding a, a an engine of a 1970s hot rod in their basement or something i don't know something uh but uh but yeah we've it, it's been um an obsessive amount of effort for years on this and i i think i my suspicion is is that we're done how about you gabe well i got 
interested in uh, what Jeff Rowe and the bros were doing because they seem to be able to leap off of this old weird rule set for a game into the kind of world before television and before uh, the internet where people lived in these things called communities uh, and they had friends and they would go to people's houses and spend time with them. Uh, and uh, that that kind of idea of a community giving sort of birth to this what weird, interesting, fun hobby that we now call role-playing games was really fascinating to me. And what I've seen with Brozer and with the idea of redeveloping this Bronstein and redeveloping these older ways of playing these cool, funky games is that you can use them to kind of build new communities of friendships. Uh, these games are not just uh, performance pieces. They're not just weird, indulgent fantasies where you, you know, you go to somebody's house or to the gaming store and you pretend to be some strange person that you've uh, idealized yourself as. These are instead games that people play with their friends. And it's been really interesting to me to see that kind of community being rebuilt around Brozer. And uh, what I really hope sort of going forward from this is that these war games, these Bronsteins, whatever you want to call them, kind of take the place of the weird performative fantasy projection kind of D&D &D, and instead become sort of ground zero for a hobby that people do with their friends, which is what mm -hmm. I'm trying to do with it, you know, personally. Uh, and so I don't know that there's there's too much left to mine in the rule sets or in rediscovering like, oh, what was Gary Gygax doing at, you know, his table with uh, Dave Arneson and David Wesley. And instead, it's kind of interesting, where else has these pieces of culture kind of dropped off the table that we can pick them up and start rebuilding actual communities around? like I would say the Bro SR has done with Brozer and the various campaigns like Trilopolis uh, and Moonshine that people have played in. These have all generated really interesting friendships and a, a real community. And I think that's what is interesting in the long, long term about Brozer is that you can use this to, to create really interesting memories with friends that uh, yeah are using the D, &D rule set but have nothing to do with your weird uh fantasies about wanting to be a uh, a hot elf maid in a chainmail bikini or whatever but instead are the basis of these really fun competitive interactions and ongoing projects that you can do with with uh your friends with uh, the people around you so that's uh, maybe a little more far farther reaching than you were looking for, but no, that's exactly what I was looking for in terms of the mission of it. You feel like it's it's primarily social. Um, I don't know. I'm very new to this. I, it sounds like you guys have some some veteran uh, fatigue from dealing with this for a while. As a as a someone that just stumbled into it, it just I, well, I maybe I... fatigue from from the conversations around it. The actual play mm -hmm. style we've only been doing for a, 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 you know, maybe a year and is still like for me, fun as hell. Yeah. Like the, the, the actual play style of Bronstein and actually playing with factions like this is still very new. But yeah, the, the, the conversations are, are very tired mm -hmm. yeah, as, as the, it was being developed. Totally makes sense. Um. No, well, I, I, 
I'm going to keep an eye on it. I'm looking to try it in some way. I'm not sure how it's going to shake out, but um, when you when you say there's these communities growing, is this online? Is this mostly in person in a certain vicinity? You don't have to name the vicinity. Follow the the browser diceless hashtag on Twitter. You'll like they, like we we dropped this last week, mm. and in a matter of days, people started uh, had uh, assigned out all of the factions of that model, all twelve. And, uh, and, and they're going, they're playing right now. Uh, if you see the tweets, you, you won't understand anything that's happening. You've, all you'll know is that people are really excited about whatever it is they're doing. Um, and, and it's going to get more baffling each day that goes yeah, on. I find it quite um, inscrutable to, to try. And yes, answer. yes, exactly. That's why you've got to be in on it. Yeah. And, and if you guys will send me a link to that so I can share that. Cause again, it's, I, I think getting people a way, an avenue to get into it easily, I think is essential. For for me, it's key to have a game night that I can put, that I don't have to put a cap on, right? So right now I was running for a while. I've been having a, a game night, but it's always tricky. Like, oh, this game only has, you know, five players potential. This, this game only has six players potential. Mm-hmm. Uh, with, for me, running it in person... Uh, I, it's really nice to be able to just put out blanket invitations Mm -hmm. to my friends, uh, and acquaintances and their relatives and their acquaintances and literally anyone that wants to come can come to a session and I can accommodate 25 players. Uh, you know, some of them will have to be playing, you know, we'll be all over the house but I can accommodate up to 20 people. And one of the interesting things that if you go back and and read about like the fifties is that people just had people over at their houses all the time. People were always having impromptu parties and impromptu dances and impromptu uh, just get togethers at this, you know, Wednesdays at Gladys's house and Thursdays at the Smith's house. And this sort of, endless stream of uh social gatherings that because they're so big don't require anybody to uh be dependent on anyone else for that last minute text of oh, i'm not gonna make it this time mm-hmm. um or all that kind of stuff and instead you can have that same kind of with a game like Rose or a Bronstein like this, you can have that same kind of open weekly get together and just say to everybody that you know that is absolutely, you know, lonely and miserable in their apartment uh, with Netflix and with the entire sort of system of the world that is now designed to convince you to do nothing at all times. I mm-hmm. uh, just sort of say like, hey, uh, at every week at this time, any number of people, I don't, you know, it could be 50 people that has not happened to me yet, you know, thankfully, but you could have 50 people show up and you can, with a little bit of tweaking, play a game, play a, a weird, bizarre D&D like diplomacy thing and uh that's that's to me the really interesting mm-hmm. sort of part of it and that's what that what it can really do the, the dynamism of an rpg like the character the fun the variety um but and you, but you don't have the downsides of uh like a traditional D campaign where, where what now is traditional where you you know you have to have the same five people every time or it's like a thing like oh shit like what what are we gonna say Susie's elf is <laughs> like what's off doing or you know you have to come up with a thing or with a board game you gotta learn a whole complex set of rules mm-hmm. whereas this is whatever set of rules you select everyone just has to understand those and then um like you said three people show up 13 people show up you know you you, you can roll up okay the the island has this many factions this time Let's, yeah, let's figure the, it out. the average number of players I've been getting since I've been running Bronsteins is eight. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like people are starting to bring like, oh, can I bring my six, my sister next week? Or, oh, I'm going to bring my wife the next time because, you know, we're doing it here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. And so it's that kind of 
openness that recreates the kind of open communities that that people used to have before we were all sort of yeah yeah, shunted into our our little pods and and let me just put in that uh your your campaign continuity doesn't have to be the same thing every week like if you're playing in a D &D campaign you might have a dungeon adventure one week and then the next week it might be a totally different party doing a wilderness adventure traveling across the map and then the week after that there might be this giant battle that you play out with like with figures in your basement um and so on uh so like uh, an rpg campaign like the way it was originally conceived is not a single linear story it is this very large world where many things are happening in it at the same time uh, and it can accommodate even many different types of games. And what we've tried to do uh, with, uh, with Browser is to introduce people to this new play mode that they can use to bring any part of their campaign to life. Um, so so if you're in your example of like, I'm running Browser and, um, and, and, uh, and then I only have six people show up and... And you, you don't have to play the whole island. You might have been playing the whole island before that. And, and you've had big battles come out between the frogs and the Romans, just like on the cover. Uh, and that happened. Um, but there, there's, a, there's a little mini Bronstein that is in the caveman faction that Kursova put together with Ryan Howard, I think it was. And so you could play out a, a Bronstein that focuses on just one aspect of your fantasy campaign. Uh, say say a small corner of the politics of what was going on in the caveman group and so on uh, the original Bronstein happened in a single city uh, the the uh, the fourth Bronstein happened in a, a banana republic um, in in South America um, and so on so um, just like you can play in a single d d campaign you can have uh, diff- a different fantasy battle every month on a different part of the map that you play out that, that feeds into the continuity, you can make up a game on the spot, uh, a bronze team scenario uh, that focuses on any part of your campaign world. You don't have to play with all the toys at once all the time. You can just, mm-hmm. just uh, play one little game, resolve something, put that into the campaign continuity, let everybody else that's passively uh, engaged with the world and that like that's following your news reports from it, for example, let them react to that. And then out of those reactions are going to come new ideas for new scenarios. And that'll, that will drive the campaign continuity and not your, uh, your, your kind of like storyteller gene uh, ethos. Um, but further, um, uh, you, you, you make a game with whoever shows up. And you make a game with whatever they're excited about. You know that that's 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 going to work. It's going to be enough. And and again, that word anti fragile comes up again. That type of campaign is one that will survive. the The ones that are dependent on the same five people showing up every week, those are going to fizzle Very out. Fragile. That's what I, that's my experience of it. Um, I I think that's a great place to end it, guys. Thank you everyone for listening to this inaugural test run of the Tukey's Digest, a uh, place to talk about new culture, talk to people that are making really cool new cultural artifacts. I feel like Browser easily qualifies as that. Ton of energy, excitement. I I am itching to get into it. I'm a little more a little more confident now hearing you guys talk through it and uh and and you know exhorting me to try to to to, to just make the leap. Which in in the pamphlet or PDF itself, it it repeatedly is like just try it fall on your face you'll figure it out uh i think it's a really cool ethos you guys have so thank you again jeffro and gabe for for coming on talking me through it and um if you're still listening subscribe vote whatever podcast platform you're on all that stuff hugely hugely helps us uh get the word out and have a great night